to sort of span both plants and animals and get us thinking about uh, nutrients. And so we start off here in, um, well, let me see if I can. I think this will be a better spot for that. All right. Um, we're going to start off in New Zealand here, which, and so sheep and wool are a major part of the industry in New Zealand. And there were some regions of New Zealand where the, the sheep had very poor quality wool. It would not, it was very brittle somehow. It wasn't working well in the looms and things like that for making, uh, for making cloth. And nutritionists in that area, agricultural nutritionists, discovered that the, the, the soil in that area was very poor in two uh, elements. It was copper and it says up here selenium. We're going to focus on the copper part of it. And that if they supplemented the copper, and so the soil was poor in copper, which meant that the plants that these were grazing on was low in copper. And if you supplemented the diet of the sheep with copper, then it improved the quality of the wool. And so this was a copper deficiency showing up in these sheep. Meanwhile, back in the United States, there was a uh, um, doctor named John Menkes who was studying a group of patients who had what came to be called Menkes disease. And um, so it's a sex-linked recessive disorder, like it says up here. Uh, it involves you know, cognitive developmental delay, uh, some, other, some other problems. But one of the characteristics of it was that there was this sort of peculiar hair. The hair would not grow very long. It would grow out, again, it had a kind of brittle quality, and so it would, it would break off. And it turns out that um, what this what was eventually figured out, and somehow, you know, Menkes made this connection, I don't know how, between knowing the effect of copper on these uh, sheep and other livestock and thinking maybe that was had something to do with the explanation of the, the brittle hair in these Menkes disease patients. And it turns out it was correct. Now, this is not a problem with copper deficiency in the diet like it was with the sheep. The problem here is a mutation in a protein that allows the cells to take up copper from the blood. So these individuals are deficient in copper uptake. So basically their cells weren't getting the copper that they needed. So how much copper do we need? You know, that's a good question. So here's a, here's a penny. Uh, now, today, pennies are made out of zinc, but uh, back in 19, before 1951, they were made out of copper. And so a copper penny weighs about 3.1 grams. So how much copper is in you, do you think? How many pennies worth of copper uh, is in you? The answer is it's about 0 0.1 grams of copper, right? So you don't need much copper, but as the Menkes disease patients show, that little tiny bit of copper is absolutely critical to normal health and development, especially cognitive development and, and some other things like the hair. So this is a good example of what we call an essential nutrient. We'll define that better in just a second. But they're needed in very small amounts, and they are absolutely essential to normal uh, health and reproduction. All right. Now here's the plant. Let's start talking about plants. This plant has, so I mentioned, you know, uh, there's two plants here, you know, um, this Big one is a wild type plant. And over here, this is a, a mutant. And this plant, essentially, the little mutant plant that's failing to thrive there, essentially has the plant equivalent of Menke's disease. So it's the same, you know, the same copper, you know, I, I, you have it written up there, right? Deficient in copper uptake. Uh, this one here is the same. Same basic protein that, you know, involves in taking copper up from the environment, from the, from the surrounding fluids into the cells. And, and incorporating into molecules inside the cell. So again, plants also don't need much copper, but a little bit of copper that they get is essential. A few things about Menkes disease today, you know, there's not, a, you can't fix that protein, um, but you can eliminate some of the symptoms of Menkes disease with supplements of very, very high levels of copper. It's actually like called copper histamate. Um, and it's uh, basically, Two amino acids, like an amino acid with a copper atom onto it. It's a sort of, if, if you get injections of that, um, it's sort of a, a way that your cells can take up and use that copper. Um, and again, it doesn't, it's not a cure, but at least it eliminates some of the symptoms associated with this. John Menkes, I did some, I looked up him as well. 
He also, in addition to this, he was also a playwright. His last play was in 2001, it was called Lady Macbeth Gets a Divorce. And it was apparently got mixed reviews <laughs> or at the time anyway. So, um, okay, so that just gets us thinking about the importance of these, you know, these uh, essential nutrients. So here it's defined up here and you have this definition also on page 18 of the workbook, right? So absolutely required for growth and reproduction and must be in, obtained from the environment. And this definition is gonna work for plants or for animals. All right, now with those essential nutrients, they can be sort of subdivided here into the macronutrients and also the micronutrients. And now here I'm going to talk more plant specifically, like, like this, these lists that I'm going to give you here are specific for plants, but there's a lot of overlap between plants and animals. And before I write that, I want to say, as we talked about before, um, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are not on these lists, right? These are not considered essential nutrients. And in fact, like with the plant body, these, these three atoms make up about 96% of the dry weight of the plant. Right, because it's mostly cellulose is what the, the dry plant body is, right? So 96% of the dry weight is, the, is that. All right, now the macronutrients, and I'm just gonna list them really quickly here. So uh, there's six macronutrients and nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium are three of them. So NPK, um, if you look on any fertilizer that you buy, uh, uh, it's gonna have three numbers somewhere big on that, uh, on that uh, fertilizer. And what those are is the nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus numbers, because those are you know, probably the three most critical macronutrients that plants need to get. The other ones are magnesium, which is, um, associated with chlorophyll and also with a lot of different enzymes, uh, including DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases. Um, there's also uh, calcium and a little bit weirdly sulfur. Um, and we, like sulfur doesn't, you know, we don't think of that as like being a really common nutrient, but remember there are amino acids that contain sulfur. And uh, so for making proteins and everything like that, sulfur is a very abundant element. So all, pretty much all of these are uh, important for making macromolecules, DNA, RNA, proteins, um, so macro, in, in macromolecules. Now, pretty much every other thing on the periodic table that isn't carbon, oxygen, or hydrogen, or that isn't um, the, the macronutrients, are categorized as micronutrients. So I'm not going to list those. It's pretty much like everything else. And uh, these are mostly, oh yeah, and I should have had some numbers here. The micro, macronutrients make up approximately 3.5% of the dry weight of the plant, right? So 96% is carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. 3.5% uh, is uh, these. And then the remaining 0.5% is the micronutrients. And these are mostly metal uh, mostly metals, and metals are tend to be very reactive when uh, they're in solution with organic molecules. They react very readily with with you know carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So very reactive um, atoms. And this has, gives them two qualities. First of all, they tend to be toxic at very high levels. So these have to be carefully regulated in terms of how much uh, plants and animals get. So um, toxic at high levels. But their reactivity also makes them incredibly important as enzyme cofactors. So uh, that is the role that most of these are playing is that they are enzyme cofactors. Now, when I say enzyme, hopefully what you picture is a protein, you know, with a complex conformation and an active site, right? Where reactants come in and then they're held in such a way that uh, some reaction can be catalyzed, you know, that lowers the activation energy of those, of those reactions. But like a diagram like this here shows, so here's a, an enzyme you might know from like electron transport. This is cytochrome oxidase. And so here's a, you know, a, a complex model showing the, the conformation of the protein. But when you really look in its active site, what you can see is that there's some 
metal atoms at very key locations, iron, magnesium, uh, copper, and these are held inside the active site in a way that when those reactants come in, you know, the reactants are held in the active site, but also these, these very reactive metal atoms are held in proximity to those as well. And that really is the, um, what makes a lot of these enzymes work. You know, so if you have a deficiency in copper, this enzyme is going to stop catalyzing its reactions. So enzyme cofactors is the really, probably the main role that most of these micronutrients are playing. All right. So this is kind of, I like sharing this with you. This is some research that I was involved in when I was a graduate student. But one of the things that I studied was uh, a process called leak senescence. And it talks about this in your textbook as well. Um, and what leaf senescence basically is, it's a form of recycling in leaves. It's programmed cell death. Programmed cell death. But the result is that, so what, what that means is that enzymes are activated inside the leaf cell that basically devour it from the inside out. So they're gonna break up a lot of macromolecules uh, one of the first things that's targeted is chlorophyll and the, the chloroplasts in general, those get broken down. But the nutrients that have been invested in that leaf are then made into a form that is mobile and can leave the leaf and go to other parts of the plant. So it's a way of recycling, recycling nutrients. And this especially happens in leaves that have become a sink on the plant, right? So the main function of a leaf is to be a source, is to, you know, for most plants, right? It's gonna photosynthesize and be a source uh, to, for photosynthates or for sugars. Um, but when a leaf becomes a sink, very often this is going to trigger this program cell death so that that leaf, its nutrients can be recycled. So recycling nutrients from leaves that are, that are, have become, uh, sinks so an older leaf or a leaf that's been infected by some pathogen or a leaf that's shaded by other leaves and it's no longer able to make more uh, sugar than it consumes it will undergo um recycling now to understand this figure here a little bit we can see the leaves down there at the bottom dag this stands for days after germination so 27 days and 37 days days after germination. So we're kind of looking at a leaf in the same position on the plant. And in this figure here, we kind of compared the levels of a lot of the micro and macronutrients in these leaves during this 10 day period. And so what's shown here on the X axis is the percent reduction. So um, you know, how much does this particular, the level of this particular nutrient drop during this 10 day period where the leaves are turning yellow and where senescence is happening. And so what you can see, there's a, you know, a good number up here. I'll talk, sort of stop it with zinc there, that these are very actively recycled. And then here's, so carbon is on there. Remember now it is not a macronutrient or a micronutrient. So a lot of the carbon is not recycled because it's in the form of cellulose. And that stays, you know, when I think about the fall leaves, right? That they, they're nice and green in the summer, then they turn yellow and eventually brown and then they fall off the tree. What's left there is the cellulose is not recycled, but the, the sugar that's more mobile, like sugar that's in the form of sucrose or something like that can get uh, recycled. But most of the carbon stays in the leaf because it's in the form of cellulose. And then you have these down here, which are not recycled. And that's not because they're not important. It's because of the way you got to get nutrients out of the leaf. So here I'm just going to, I think this won't be too difficult of a question for you. If we're going to, we have these nutrients in the leaf and we want to export them out of the leaf and go to another part of the plant. Are they going to travel via the xylem or the phloem? Which you think? So think about that for a second. This is not learning how to do xylem or phloem. You can, you can uh, give me a hand and say, what do you think? So nutrients exiting the leaf, are they going to go to the xylem or to the phloem? What do you like? Okay. See, most people are doing phloem. That's right, right? Xylem really can only bring things from the root up to the leaf. To go from the leaf out to other parts of the plant, including up to the seeds or down to other leaves, that requires moving by the phloem. 
And with some of these nutrients, you know, remember the phloem is a living cytoplasm. And so some of these nutrients are just not phloem mobile. So they are not, they're chemically not compatible with the phloem. So uh, not phloem mobile. So those nutrients end up getting lost to the environment. But this makes a lot of sense. As you're going to see, plants spend a ton of energy trying to extract, basically mining the soil to get most of these nutrients. And to just lose them to the environment and the leaf that's going to, you know, fall off the tree anyway would be a big waste of energy. So this is a pretty efficient recycling program, this leaf senescence. Can I answer any questions about that before we? First leaf senescence. It's also pretty. Right? If you've ever lived in a part of the country where the leaves change color in the fall, that's what's underlying that is are these uh, molecular changes in the leaf. Okay. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and you'll need, let's go back to learning catalytics here as you think about this question. Now, this one is ungraded because I just want you to think about this. Now, as you're getting learning catalytics on, let me tell you a little bit about soil. So, you know, if we think about plants and nutrients, we have to think about soil. And there's a bigger section in your textbook about it. Soil is very complicated, it's got lots of different components in it, but there's really just one that I'm going to focus on and that I want you to focus on, which is clay. And clay is very abundant in most soils. And clay is negatively charged. And so you can see there's some little negative signs up here, right? So clay uh, tends to be a common component of soil, and it also tends to be negatively charged. And so now um, this is an ungraded learning catalytic question. So read over it and we're ready to go. Okay, good. So it's, it's running. Thank you, by the way, Dr. Taylor, for writing this for me because I'm having. Yeah. Now, I made this one ungraded because honestly, there are probably two answers that are both correct for it and one that is definitely incorrect uh, based on vocabulary. So feel free to talk about it while we're waiting to get the notes on here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now it's delivering. So go ahead and let's see if we can all get answers in here for this one. Again, it's ungraded. Um, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> I, yes, that's what I would say. Okay, yeah, yes. I, mean, I think it might be multiple choice. Yeah. Yeah, it is ungraded. This one is all 100% participation. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it I think it is only gonna let you pick one. Okay, how are we doing? Have we got people logged on and yeah, we've got uh oh I see. Yeah, right, I'm taking uh, either. Yeah, we'll okay, good. Okay, so did many people pick A? Uh, only two percent pick A. Only two percent pick A. That that's good. Why there's there's a vocabulary problem with A. What is it? Somebody, what is the problem with A? <laughs> Like anions are negatively charged, right? So we have a, a problem here. We have a positive that magnesium is a cation, right? So anions are negatively charged. So that was just a little chemistry review. But honestly, both of these, both of the other two questions, which both people pick one or the other, are are actually correct. And so this creates this indicates that there's a little challenge here for plants too. So if we look at B, like this, these clay particles are good because you know a positively charged uh, ion like magnesium is going to be attracted to those clay problems, pro um, those clay particles, and they keep uh, the, the, that nutrient in the soil, right? Remember, there's water running through the soil, and, and these magnesium ions could dissolve into that water and get carried away. But then C is also right, because the plant now has to fight with the clay to get those nutrients into its body. So this is just a challenge for plants. So B and C are both actually pretty good answers to this question. All right, so now we're going to think about how the plant deals with this. And so we're going to look at a simple experiment, and you've got this on uh, page 20 of your workbook here. So here's a plant 
and it's growing hydroponically, right? So it's growing in some liquid, and we can we can uh, test the pH of this liquid. So we're going to ask, like, okay, you know, does the plant have the ability to alter the pH of its environment? And so we have a control here, a negative control, which is a steam treated root. So basically, and you saw this on the exam too. You know, steam is sometimes a a useful way of killing cells in plants for, for experimental purposes because it kills the cells, but it still leaves all the structures intact. So the cellulose isn't damaged by that. And so we can kill the cells, but still keep the overall root structure intact. Okay. So here's what the graph looks like. Go ahead and draw. You have to, I made it so you have to draw that onto your worksheets. Um, but as you're drawing it, think about what it means. And there is a learning catalytics question associated with this one here, which is going to start up right now. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It was a. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one's delivering here. Again, this is more of a chemistry review here than a, uh, than a biology question. Let's try and get your answers into this one. All right. Three, two. Oh wait, no. Okay, never mind. All right. <laughs> okay. People have trouble logging on. Yes. Okay. Okay. Are you still thinking about it? Yeah. I don't think this is too difficult of a question. Was it? Is it people are having difficulty with uh, access? Or Okay, most people have responded. So we're going to go ahead and, and finish this one up. So A is the correct answer here, right? So the H is dropping. That means more acidic. I just wanted to remind you about that, right? So, um, so we're going to take that little bit of information there, right? A living root causes the environment to become more acidic. And now this is probably the really important um, learning, learning catalytic question because here I'm asking you to put together these two things to try to see the best statement. So feel free to talk about this for a minute. You've got a lot to read through on this one. Um, but you're thinking about what you know about clay particles and this little experiment here and pick the best answer based on all of those observations. Right. And again, I would encourage you to talk to people around you um, on this one if you uh, if you want to before you enter your answer. Like on a lot of the exam questions, there's a lot to read. You got to read it very carefully, looking at all the vocabulary words and how they're used throughout there. So let's go ahead and. And then that'll be it. Okay. All right, so we got about this one. I want, I want you to take your time on this one and look at it. So I'll give you a little bit more time. Feel free to discuss it. Down here. 
Uh, ten more seconds, please. Get your get your answers in there. Ten, nine, eight, seven. We okay? Six, five, four, three, two, one. Watching the trends. There. All right, what is, what is the class like? 69%. Okay, good. So, so the almost everybody went for the correct answer here, which is C, right? So, now I didn't talk anything about pumping protons, but you know, if you're lowering the pH of a solution, you have to, you know, that, that is, uh, you know, that is related to the proton concentration in that solution. And so, A and B can be eliminated because they do have a mechanism, right? What you have to do is to neutralize those flame particles. And if you're pumping protons into the environment, protons would, would do a very good job of neutralizing the negative charge on the flame. Um, B isn't a very good answer because, you know, if you remove protons from the environment, that would not make it more acidic. That would make it more basic, right? So this one you can kind of eliminate based on this idea that it, the plant can't be removing the protons. And so they do actually have this, this mechanism. So we're going to talk about this, the way that that plants are in competition with the clay and how they, they deal with that. So first we have to think a little bit about some anatomy and you know, there's a lovely adaptation that plants have to increase the surface area of the roots, which are root hairs. We wanted to draw like an, one root epidermal cell here. All right, so there's a nucleus, there's organelles in here. So this is a, a root epidermal, uh, uh, so root epidermis. And of course this is, you know, there'd be other epidermal cells above and below, some of which also have root hairs on them. But the point is that the root hair is an extension of a single cell. So, you know, it's like a lot of adaptations in our, in the animal gut and in the, gut, the gills of fish and things like that. These cells have extensions to increase the surface area. So, the root hairs are going to have a big increase in surface area. They have very thin walls, and that's because, you know, they just like the lining of the lungs, right? You want to have that barrier uh, between the environment to be as thin as possible to improve diffusion across those, uh, those structures, so thin walls. And also, they are loaded up with uh, uh, pumps and channels. pumps and channels, because this is the main place where we're going to get exchange with the environment is across these uh, root, um, these root hairs. All right. So again, you can just see on there how much they increase the overall surface area of the root. Now, in the next couple slides here, I'm going to show you just some pictures from the textbook, but I feel like looking at them together and working through them a little bit is helpful. And there'll be some learning catalytics questions about this as well. Well, let me just check on something. Okay, yeah. So, um, so this is figure 36.8. And just to orient you here, the orange thing is a clay particle. And so up here you can see there's magnesium and, and calcium to two cations stuck to the clay. And then this down here is the root hair. And I think this drawing is a little weird in that it just shows those two protons kind of like in the environment around. But of course, those are protons which are being pumped out of the root hair. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a closer look at the proton pumps that do this. So we're pumping out those protons. The protons are neutralizing the soil. And this is what's referred to as cation exchange. So the protons neutralize the clay and that frees up uh, something like the magnesium and the calcium, which then looks like they're just going right into the root hair, but in fact, as you see, of course, there are, there are channels um, or co-transporters that, that import these, these uh, nutrients. All right. So that's just giving a little more nuance to this figure here. Um, there was something, just to go back to a question from a little while ago, here's the same diagram here. Oh, it's kind of running off the edge. But um, one challenge with this is if there is a lot of water running through the soil, when those, once those uh, cations get freed from the clay, then they are suspect to being like washed away and then the plant doesn't have uh, access to them. This is called leaching. Um, and so, you know, the plant in a way just has to like try and release those cations and take them up as fast as possible, but it does sometimes lead to uh, a depletion of the soil just through that runoff. 
Okay. So now we're going to go back. Let me see if you can get learning catalytics up again. We have a couple. Well, actually, no. Here, well, there's a question first. It is learning catalytics that we'll look at. Does anybody have any questions about this here so far? So now we're going to zoom in then on this root here. And this is figure 36.10. And now just to get you oriented, notice here's the root hair and we're looking at that upper surface of it. So on this membrane, right below the line, below the membrane is the cytoplasm. And above the membrane is the environment. So here we have this proton pump. It's using ATP to pump protons out. And now while you're getting learning catalytics up, and running again on your on your device. Uh, taking a minute to explain to your notebook if that's your style or just something to say next to you. How energy stored in ATP is used to release cations from the clay in soil. So I'm asking you to kind of put these two together. So just you know, you can write out a, a, a simple sentence to say to somebody else. How is ATP? How does the plant use ATP to uh, get access to cations in the soil? Go ahead. Think about that. Talk about it, and get learning catalytics up because we have a few more questions. All right. So just to answer this question, I got to think a, a good explanation of this is, okay, we're using ATP to pump protons, right? We're moving protons against their concentration gradient to acidify the soil, out, to acidify the environment outside of the root. That is going to neutralize the clay particles. And when you neutralize the clay particles, that allows for this process of cation exchange, right? Where the cations are then free to be taken up by the plant. Yeah. Why does the clay favor protons? It's it's really just a matter of abundance, right? So when you're pumping those little protons out, um, I think you know I, I don't want to throw numbers out there, but I think they're vastly, vastly in excess of. I mean, if if the negative charges are exposed, um, they're going to stick to anything that's positive. And so there's just a lot more protons out there. They're going to displace at least some of those nutrients of the cation. Yeah. Okay. All right, so now this is a learning catalytics question, and, and maybe have a little guilty of like kind of eating a dead horse here. You, you've, you've thought about co transport a lot, but now I've added some of these figures on. So we can see in this figure here how, uh, you know, a cation like potassium is entering the cell. And then over here, we are seeing how not an anion, but a negatively charged molecule, nitrate in this case, NO3, is entering the cell. And so which of these? Would be best described as co-transport, or also, or, or sorry, co secondary active transport or co-transport. So this just really is kind of review of concepts you've seen before. There's a lot of co-transport, secondary active transport mechanisms throughout all of physiology, and so just another opportunity to make sure you recognize them. So. So this is going to be A, this is going to be B, and then you can answer C for both. Okay, so get your answer to this one, please. In five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so um, sounds like over 80% got the right answer, which is in this case, it's just B, right? Because in B, so this is, we would describe this as co transport because the way those protons diffuse back into the cell through this channel, right? So that if we just looked at the protons, we'd say, oh, that's facilitated diffusion, what this protein is doing. But this protein sort of demands that, okay, if one of those protons is going to diffuse down its concentration gradient, we're going to move the nitrate against its concentration gradient in the cell. 
Now, if we want to look at C, I uh, sorry, look at, at the uh, potassium. That's actually being drawn in by the electrochemical gradient. So this one is co-transport up here. This is diffusion uh, along an electrochemical gradient. Because as you pump those protons out, what you're going to do is you're going to create a more negative environment inside the cell. I'm going to put a lot of little negative charges up here, right? And it's going to be more positive outside the cell. And so for a positively charged ion like, like potassium, right? If you just open up a channel, it's going to be drawn in by that electrochemical um, gradient. Okay. All right, I think we have now our last learning catalytics question here, which goes back to this as well, but for today, but, and that is if you inhibit the proton pump, right? So we're gonna block the proton pump, which of these uh, forms of transport would stop? And I'm not saying like immediately, I'm saying like, okay, eventually uh, would this affect either of these forms of transport here, okay? So again, same answer A, B, or both. Actually, one of my sort of ulterior motives for asking these learning catalytics questions today is to remind you that, like, there are concepts that are going to come up again and again in this class as far as thinking about things like co transport and electrochemical gradients and things like that. So, testing yourself often on these things, making sure you have really good understanding of these as we go forward is going to be very important. All right. Good response. Right? Okay. So, I. Uh, Four, three, two, one. What did the class like for this one? We went for good. All right. So uh, C, right? So both of these are dependent on that proton gradient. So if we inhibit the, the proton pumps, we're going to eliminate both forms of transport eventually, right? And so those proton pumps really set up a whole lot of important things going on in the in the group. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so this question is all I, I just want you to think about here. We're not going to do learning catalytics for these. Um, and so this, what we're going to do now, like there's lots of nutrients we can talk about. Like every nutrient is important, micro or macronutrient. But the one I'm going to focus on for most of the rest of the class time here is the one that is probably the most important because it is the one that is like the most limiting to plants out there in the environment. Right, and that is nitrogen, which you need for making DNA and RNA, and you need for making proteins. And of course, we're also dependent on that too, because the amino acids that plants make, that's how we get our nitrogen also, right? So nitrogen is really important for plants and for animals. Um, so here, let's just use one, two, and three here. We'll just do this quicker with fingers. So I changed my wording on this. The most abundant form of nitrogen on the planet is, which of these? Go ahead and just with fingers, which one? Which one? So. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> which, which one is it? <laughs> yeah, it's number one. Uh, that's atmospheric nitrogen, N2. And, um, you know, about 80% of the air in this room is N2, right? Way more abundant than oxygen or, or, or carbon dioxide. And this is an interesting molecule because it's got these three very strong, short, stable bonds between those two nitrogen. And even though this is a very abundant form of nitrogen, it is very difficult for uh, for organisms to access because it's got these. It's, it's a very stable molecule. So yeah, N two. Now here's a again more of a chemistry question than a biology question. The reduced form of nitrogen most easily incorporated into organic molecules is what? So here I'm going to ask you to choose between these two here, and the word reduced is kind of important here. So. One of these represents nitrogen in a reduced form. And so think about this for a moment, and then we'll use finger signals two or three for which one you like for this. Okay, put up some fingers in three, two, one, go for it. What do you like here? Okay. I'm seeing, okay, yeah. So most, I've seen two and three, mostly twos. Be careful here. Uh, this is ammonium and it's the reduced form of nitrogen. Now, a lot of 
people are thrown off by the, the negative and positive charges. What I brought is, is nitrate, number is B is nitrate and three is ammonium. Um, I will say that, you know, this can kind of go back and forth between ammoni, ammonia, NH3, but it, at a neutral pH, like you'd find inside of a plant cell, um, it's going to be in its, it, it's going to pick up a proton from the environment that could be NH4 plus. Um, but remember, in, in the nitrate, NO3, that nitrogen is born, is, is attached to three oxygen. It is in a very oxidized form. You know, oxygen is very electronegative, and it's like pulled the electrons away from that nitrogen towards the oxygen. And so essentially that, that nitrogen there is sort of, you know, stripped of its electrons, whereas in, you know, hydrogen has a much lower electronegativity. So in the ammonia, in the NH4, it pulled all of those shared electrons closer to the nitrogen. And so that's in its more reduced form. And that's the form that the plant really needs to, uh, to initiate its whole sort of nitrogen economy inside of the, the plant. Okay, so this is going to be an important drawing. We're going to add a lot of stuff to this, and we're going to come back to it a couple times. But you can see that I, right in the middle there, I put this important um, uh, ammonium molecule. Sorry, ammonium. I got to be careful about that, right? Ammonium is NH4+. Plus. And I want to start with this because this is, you know, the, the starting point for making all of these important molecules, especially amino acids. All right, so plants can take this ammonium and make it into amino acids. They can make it into nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, is all these important macromolecules. You cannot do that, right? You cannot drink ammonium and then make all the, all the amino acids that you need. We are dependent on plants to do these reactions for us. And then we consume the plants or we consume animals that consume the plants. But one way or another, this is where our amino acids are coming from, right, largely. Okay, so we're gonna look at the different ways, the three different pathways that plants can get that important reduced form of nitrogen into their bodies. And so we're gonna go back and forth between these two slides here. So the first one is definitely something that's not accessible to most plants out in nature, and that is fertilizer. So plants that are, uh, you know, when we fertilize plants through agriculture, pretty much what we are giving them is exactly the form of nitrogen that they need, that reduced form of nitrogen, um, ammonium. And most fertilizer is made through a process that was discovered, you know, back in around 1900 uh, called the Harbor Bosch process. And it uses atmospheric nitrogen plus some hydrogens. Um, and that is basically used to make this reduced form of nitrogen. Now, this is not an easy chemical reaction to do. It takes place in these big, like, you know, uh, factories and it uses a huge amount of energy. For example, there are steps in this that have to take place at 200 atmospheres of pressure and 400 degrees Celsius. Incredibly stable, right? Those three covalent bonds between the nitrogen, it's really, really stable. So you have to put a lot of energy in to break those bonds and start to form new ones. Um, and so we had a huge amount of energy. There's some interesting facts about this, about, you know, somewhere between two and 3% of the global energy supply. So all of the energy used by humans every year, um, about two to 3% of it goes to this, right? For, for making nitrogen for fertilizer. And it's also estimated that it, based on the U.S. diet, that about 50% of the nitrogen in you right now also came out of one of these factories here. Uh, and then got into our, our food system through fertilizing, and then you consumed it. So about 50% of your nitrogen came from this process as well. All right, now going back to this, you can see we have a root and root hairs here. So if we're gonna, you know, so I'm gonna use the numbers that I have over here. So pathway number one, right, is we could just give the plants ammonia, and then they will very happily take that up through their root hairs, and that becomes available for this nitrogen economy inside the plant. Okay, that's great. But that's just for plants that are being fertilized by people, right? And that is not the majority of plants. So the next form of nitrogen we're gonna think about is the one that is most accessible to most plants. And that is nitrate. And nitrate, as it says here, is produced by decomposition. So bacteria and uh, tree holes and small eukaryotes, fungi and things like that in the soil, they break down um, organic material 
and they release into the soil nitrate, so NO3. And plants can take that up. We actually looked here, right? Here's the, the mechanism by which, this co-transport mechanism by which plants can take in this nitrate. But remember, what they need is, is this. They need to reduce it, right? They need it in the reduced form. Sorry, I used NH4 plus up there, and then I used NH3 down here. Remember, those are sort of interchangeable. So this is the reaction that takes place in the plant cell. And basically, the plant is going to invest some energy here, um, specifically uh, in the form of these reduced molecules here. So NADH is a, you know, an energy storage molecule you're familiar with glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and electron transport. Also, I'm going to add up here NADPH, the one that's made during NADPH, is another electron donor that, um, you know, that's associated with photosynthesis. But these provide the electrons needed to reduce that nitrogen. So this is the plant spending some of its own energy to reduce the, the nitrate, the nitrogen and the nitrate into um, into the reduced form over here. All right, so there's an energy cost to the plant for this. This is, and this is the way most plants get their nitrogen. So let's go back to this. So number two, decomposition is going to put nitrate into the soil. And again, that can come into the root hairs through that co-transport mechanism. And then it can get into root cells. And then it has to get converted you know, using energy from the plant into the reduced form that is necessary. Okay. And then there's one more. Now, this is probably the rarest form, but it's also one of the, the coolest. Everybody, well, maybe let me stop and see any questions before we look at the third one. Remember, why are we focused on nitrogen? This is the the nutrient that is probably most limiting to plant growth for most plants out there, right? And humans spend a lot of energy to pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere and feed it to the plants that we love. And plants out in nature have to take in, are relying on decomposition of, or, of organic matter. And then they take that in and spend their own energy to, to convert it into a form that they can use. Okay, so number three here, now this is not, uh, very common, but there is a, there are some plants that can fix nitrogen. And when I say nitrogen fixation here, I mean the same as I mean with carbon fixation. So taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere, that atmospheric form of nitrogen, and converting it into organic molecules inside the cell. And this is made possible by symbiosis between a plant and a bacterium. The plant, these are called the legumes. So beans and peas are examples of, uh, of legumes. And then also bacterium that live inside the plants, and these are called rhizobium. Rhizo, that's, that's Latin for root, so rhizobium. And this is a symbiosis, right? It's mutually beneficial to both of the, of both of the organisms involved there. So here's the reaction that takes place. Now, I'm not going to put everything in here. And I, and honestly, I have to admit, I haven't totally balanced this reaction. Well, I guess this reaction is balanced, but notice that this is taking place in the bacteria. So the bacteria has the enzymes for catalyzing this very, very difficult reaction, right? Of taking atmospheric nitrogen, N2, and with a bunch of elect uh, and, you know, some protons from the environment, and it's going to convert that into this reduced form of nitrogen. Okay. So this ain't free. This is very, very energy intensive. It takes about 16, it's thought to require about 16 ATPs, uh, you know, per, so it's a ADP plus a phosphate. I always have to write the whole equation there. So for every atmospheric nitrogen, it's gonna take about 16 ATPs. It's also gonna take, uh, you know, eight electrons which are coming again from a molecule like NADH. So again, that's a lot of energy input there. And then eventually protons are gonna jump onto this as well, you know, because once we reduce that nitrogen, then it's gonna attract the proton. But that's it right now. So remember for humans, if we wanna do this reaction, take atmospheric nitrogen and make it into the reduced form of nitrogen, we have to put in a ton of energy, you know, in the form of heat and pressure. Now, these bacteria have evolved enzymes that can do it, but it's still very, very energy intensive. And 
why do the bacteria, why this, here's the, what benefits the bacteria, right? They get all of the energy, the sugars and things that they need to, to make those ATP and to make those NADHs. They get that from the plant. So the plant is feeding the bacteria and the bacteria on the, um, is, make, is doing this important reaction that the plant benefits from by getting nitrogen. We'll, we'll write that out in just a second. Okay, so let's go back to our diagram here. Now we have to draw a rhizobium here in the soil. So this little bacteria, not drawn to scale, of course, but here we have this bacteria that is um, living inside the soil. So this is route number three. And here is this really abundant atmospheric nitrogen, but that most, um, most pl plants don't have access to. So that goes into the plant, into the bacteria, and it creates for the plant that reduced form of nitrogen. So that's the third route of, of nitrogen entering uh, the plant this symbiosis. So one good, I don't see people still drawing here, so. Let me show you something kind of cool here while you're thinking about this. This is the, this is sort of an ancient Chinese symbol for soybean, which was, you know, called chu. Um, and this, the symbols are very representational, very pictographical, you know, and so they represent actual pictures. And so soybeans are a legume. And this symbol over here is representing a plant. And you can kind of see it, right? You've got the roots going down there, and then you have the above ground part of the plant. But then the other symbol is thought to represent like a hand, kind of like reaching up out of the soil. And, and it is thought that this came because farmers realized that soybeans somehow they were able to grow in soil where other organisms couldn't grow, other plants couldn't grow very well. And they knew there was something going on. So this idea that there's something like reaching up out of the soil to sort of like support the plant or help the plant is thought to be sort of the derivation of this. And it's kind of neat that they knew something was happening. This plant was somehow different in terms of the way it was interacting with the soil. But it turns out what it was is that the rhizobium, those bacteria in the soil, were providing nitrogen to this plant and allowing it to grow on soil that maybe was nitrogen poor where other plants couldn't grow. Yeah. How does the, so the question is, how does the rhizobium get the nitrogen? I have left that kind of vague here. Remember, this is atmospheric nitrogen, and it is small enough, just like an oxygen molecule or a CO2 molecule. It's just going to follow along concentration gradients. It gets into the, you know, I guess here, it would dissolve into the soil water, and then it's just going to diffuse into those cells. Yeah, good question. But there's nothing, like no pumps or channels or anything needed for that. Yes. The rhizobia is inside the root. I'll show you some micrograph micro pictures of that in a second. Yeah. So the rhizobia does live inside the roots. Yes. So the rhizobia has to stay like close to the soil so it doesn't end up Yeah, a couple of these questions. Let me just show you some pictures of rhizobium inside roots. Um, yeah, so they, on the roots of these legumes, they, they form these little, uh, these little structures called nodules. And they are filled with rhizobia. I want you to see it. If you cut one of these nodules across, you can see that they're like kind of red colored inside. And that's actually an interesting story behind that as well. But these nodules house, you know, millions and millions of these bacteria. And so yes, they are fairly close to the surface. That would make sense because they have to you know, be able to get that atmospheric nitrogen in. Um, this is a, a neat figure that was in an older edition of your textbook. And I'll put it up on Canvas so you can see it. But it talks a little bit about how this interaction starts, you know? so. Here's a root hair and the little red dots represent the rhizobium. And it starts with the plant sending out a signal. It sends out a chemical signal into the environment sort of saying like, hey, are there any rhizobium nearby? The rhizobium then respond. And you can see the root hair, it almost like lovingly sort of like scoops them up and opens up and they are living inside the cell, right? They are not like next to the cell. They're inside the cytoplasm of this cell. And then they travel into the, the, into the plant where they start to grow and multiply to make this um, uh, to, to make this structure called a nodule. So yes, they are actually inside the plant, a real true symbiosis, these two organisms living together for mutual benefit. 
So here's a little cost benefit analysis, right? For any of these things. So there are definitely costs to the plant of having the symbiosis, right? They have to use sugars to attract and feed those rhizobiums, right? Um, they make special structures, these nodules on their roots, which they're using their energy to produce those as well. And I haven't really talked about this, but they also, there are genes in the legume genome that are specifically there just to help make the life easier for those rhizobium. And a, a great example of this one is a protein called uh, leg hemoglobin, leg for meaning legume, leg hemoglobin. Oh, I don't think I'm spelling that right. Let me get the right spelling. Now, hemoglobin, of course, that's familiar to you, right? And this is a iron-containing protein that binds to oxygen. That's what this one does, too. And in fact, this is why the nodules have this red color, is because they create a hemoglobin-like protein in these nodules. And the reason is, I'll just add this here, is that those, those reactions that are catalyzed by the bacteria, um, they are much more efficient in anaerobic conditions. So in the absence of oxygen, those nitrogen fixation reactions are much more efficient. And so the plant produces a hemoglobin like protein to sort of uh, bind to the, the loose oxygen that's around and help to improve the efficiency. So um, removes oxygen. Well, I should say removes free oxygen from the nodule. So there's a lot of cost to the plant, but the benefit is this really, really important one, which is access to N2 as a nitrogen source, right? This super, really, really, really abundant form of nitrogen. They, can, they have access to that because they have this bacteria that they feed and take care of, and it has enzymes that can catalyze that reaction to reduce that atmospheric nitrogen. All right. I got one more kind of neat topic to, to go over before we wrap up here, but can we answer any questions about this before we go on or about any of the nitrogen pathways? Yeah. So, well, remember, so nitrogen fixation is only possible for these plants that have evolved this symbiosis. So like, it's not like a corn plant is like, hey, there's not enough my environment, I'm going to like recruit some rhizobium, right? That, that doesn't work, right? So there's just a small number of plants that have evolved the ability to, to have these interactions. Yeah. Does the plant use anything to capture oxygen? Does the plant use anything to capture oxygen? Not that I'm aware of. You know, I think that it is just, um, uh, it is purely just to sequester the oxygen away. I should probably check on this, but I think like, you know, if you get impossible meats, those plant-based meat products, you know, uh, leg hemoglobin is one of the proteins in there that helps give them like a red sort of meaty color. So it actually looks sort of like ground beef. I think I got to check on that, but I'm pretty sure it, that, that it's used in the food industry for that. Yeah. Um, Yeah, the rhizobium just in the soil. Yes, they grow and multiply in the soil, but and they make. I mean, you know, they use that nitrogen for themselves as well, right? But inside the plant, they're way more efficient because of this low oxygen environment that's created, and the plant's just like handing them sugars and saying, like, here, you take all the energy you need, and they wouldn't have access to that by themselves out of the soil, right? But they can still do these kind of. They can do the reaction inefficiently in the absence of the plant. Yeah. All right. So here's the last thing I want to tell you about today, and that is uh, that plants have the plants have the internet. Did you know that that plants have the internet? Um, this is this was discovered, you know, about a decade ago, and it is has been run rather really interesting and kind of cool discoveries in uh, recent biology. And I'll explain what I mean about this. So here's an experiment, and you have this uh, on page 25 of the workbook. Okay, so here's this group went out to just naturally growing plants out in the environment, and they did something which I'm sure is was very hard. And I don't know technically how they did this, but they took a, a tree 
that essentially encased it in a, a bubble so that they could control what, what gases it was getting. And now, you know, the, the, form of the form of carbon that's most common out in the environment is C12, right? That's the isotope of carbon that's most common. But what they did is they fed into this chamber. I, I, I guess it was C14. I, I think I said C13 up here, but C14. So they put in, you know, basically C14, sort of a heavy isotope of carbon. And then they let this plant photosynthesize. So all of the sugars that this plant made for some period of time contained this heavier isotope of carbon, which they could, you know, that's, that, that, this is not abundant out in nature. So this would be the only source of that. And when they looked at plants nearby, what they found was that they had uh, sugar containing carbon-14. So somehow sugar was moving from this tree that they were feeding the C14 to neighboring plants in the environment. And what we now know is that it was moving through the soil um, and it was moved by an organism, not a plant, right? So uh, here's, here's what was discovered for this. Now we got to draw a root system on each of these here. And another thing that's common in the soil are fungi. So um, funguses live in the soil and there are a particular group of funguses that make these really intimate interactions with uh, plant roots. In fact, they even will like, you know, drill through the cell wall and they will link their cytoplasms up with the cytoplasms of root cells. So here we have this fungus in the soil. And it sends out these structures called hyphae that connect to these different plants. And a fungus turns out to be connected to thousands and thousands of different plants in its environment. So it's sending out these little structures and it's connecting to the cytoplasms. And what these experiments started to show was that, in fact, the fungus was conducting um, not just sugars, but other nutrients and even molecules like hormones and things like that between the plants. So the C14 that was made in that tree is passing through the fungus and is getting delivered to some of the plants out in the environment there. All right. They did another kind of cool follow-up experiment to this. Um, Oh, so here's just a picture of some of these uh, uh, the structures called mycelium, these long extensions of these, of these soil fungi that connect with the roots. All right, so here's a similar experiment. Again, we've got our little tree in a bubble here um, where it's got access to that heavy carbon. And again, here's our, our fungus down in the soil. And then we have a bunch of plants nearby. And the fungus is making a connection to all of these, right? So this is the fungus. So yeah, the, the, this, the, the nickname given to this is they called it the wood wide web, right? You know, the idea that this fungus is connecting all of these different plants metabolically um, as computers would be connected in the, in, in the web, right? So notice that the plants here, we have this one that is deeply shaded. Right, so there's this plant is is uh, shaded by other plants. This one's in partial shade, and this one's in full light here. And what they looked at was for the deep shade plant, for the partial shade plant, and for the full light plant, how much did they receive from that 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 tree? You know, how much sugar, how much of these photosynthesis photosynthates did they receive from the you know the the source tree, right? And just to wrap up here in times, so what you can see, um, I'll just go ahead and answer my question here that the mycorrhizal fungi, these soil fungus, conduct sugars through the receiver plants, right? Um, based on their metabolic need. So the plants that were in the shade, they got more C14 sugar than the plants that were in the full sunlight and were photosynthesizing on their own. So the thought here is that, okay, the fungus wants to keep its network strong. You know, it wants to maintain as many, the, the more plants it's making contact with, and the healthier those plants are, the better off the fungus is going to be, because it's also, you know, I mean, it is benefiting from, from these the sugars and things like that that it's getting from the plants and, uh, as well. And so, you know, that plant that's in the deep shade right now, maybe sometime in the future, that one's going to be in the sun and some other plant's going to be in the shade. And so the fungus is almost like sort of, you know, in, in a way we don't understand, selectively directing 
these nutrients to different plants based on their metabolic need. And so that's, this is a big, you know, a, a kind of a neat discovery of the interaction, metabolic interactions between organisms in the natural environment. Um, and I think there's probably a lot of more interesting work that's going to come out of this and, as, as people learn more about. It. All right, so let me 